Good morning. If you've got your Bibles, the passage that we're looking at, as Sean said, is in Luke chapter 1. And through the course of the coming weeks, we're looking at various passages on the biblical Christmas story, and those passage references will be in your weekly update or on the Facebook page, Bethel Facebook page, so you can read the story ahead. But if you've got your Bible right now, I'd like to read with you the text that we're looking at this morning in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Luke 1, verse 26, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy." the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We're going to do some thinking this morning. But first of all, let's pray. Father, as we look into your word, again we recognize that the Bible is unlike any other literature that we have read this past week or that we will read in the week ahead. And so, we want to treat it with respect and honor, but we also recognize that we require your Holy Spirit to really open the eyes of our mind to apprehend, to discern, to interpret your truth. So, Lord, we pray that you would assist us in this task this week and in the coming weeks as we consider what child is this? For we pray in the name of your unparalleled Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. When he died in 1984, Francis Schaeffer was thought of as being one of the most influential thinkers and philosophers an apologist, a Christian thinker, philosopher, an apologist, and maybe one of the greatest in the 20th century. He was a very perceptive observer of cultural macro trends. And when he saw things happening in his world of the 20th century that were opposed to the, to the Bible or to a biblical worldview, he thundered with the ire of a biblical prophet. I wrote about him in my blog post this past week, and here's something he said that was really interesting. This he said in the 1950s. Our generation is overwhelmingly naturalistic. Our youth group has been studying worldviews on Friday night, and this past Friday night, Barry told us that they talked about naturalism. What is naturalism? Well, Schaefer said his generation back in the 50s was different from any other generation that had preceded it any time in the world. Now, how is that? He said that in his generation, there was what we might call an allergy to that which is supernatural. That the people of his era were increasingly anti-supernatural. That only a natural explanation would do. 
So when people of his era were asking the, the oldest question in philosophy, why is there something rather than nothing, they would say, well, there's something because of natural consequences. It must just simply be a natural cause and a natural effect to bring what we have today. And so when it came to uh, the origin of the, of the universe, they would use the, the physics of Big Bang cosmology. When it came to the concept of the origin of life, they would think in terms of evolutionary biology. When it came to things like love and courage and honesty and faithfulness, those issues of the heart, they would say, well, that's simply just a function of brain chemistry. Schaefer used the analogy of two chairs. And he said, if you think of two chairs, those two chairs are two different worldviews. The first is an asymmetrical, sorry, the first is a symmetrical worldview. And the symmetrical worldview is the worldview that says most things that happen happen by the forces of nature. But every once in a while, we recognize the intervention of the supernatural. That's what most generations in the past have believed. The second chair, though, Schaefer said, was that everything only, only, only happens by nature, by natural causes. And Schaefer said in the 1950s, that was the tipping point where many people, most people in the Western world, believed that every effect had a natural cause and that everything could only be explained by science and empirical analysis and there was absolutely and emphatically no room for the supernatural. So, here we are in the 21st century. What are we to do with the Christmas narrative the birth of Christ narrative, like what we've just read. Heavenly messengers, angel choirs, a guiding star, a virgin birth? Really? Your worldview is the lens through which you process life and events and gain and loss and winning and losing and purpose and meaning, and right and wrong, and success and failure. And I know you're tired of me saying it, but worldviews are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. Whether people recognize they have a worldview, they have one. Even if they can't articulate what their worldview is, they have one. You have one. And Schaefer said those two chairs are two comprehensive, very broad worldviews. Either... You believe that things can happen by supernatural, or you don't. Worldviews, though, should be determined by evidence. And I would submit, and I'd love to have the conversation with you if you want to, that the evidence overwhelmingly supports the existence of God. In fact, God must exist. God is a metaphysical necessity. And because God exists, because he sometimes chooses to intervene supernaturally in the affairs of men in our lives, that's why we believe that things generally have a natural explanation, except when they don't. And we can be pretty thankful that he does intervene supernaturally, like he did in the Christmas story. Let's go back verse by verse. Let's pick it up at verse 26. In the sixth month, so what Luke has just been recording is this improbable conception, pregnancy of this old woman Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist and a cousin to Mary. In her sixth month, the angel Gabriel. Let's stop there. There are many angels in the scripture. That's part of supernatural. Supernatural messengers from God, but only two of them are ever named two of the most important, and this is one of them, Gabriel. Gabriel was sent from God to a city. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. There's no word in ancient Greek for town. It's either a village or it's a city. Probably in reality, Nazareth was a town. It was a town, archaeologists tell us it was probably a town of hundreds of people. 
So, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee, or a town of Galilee, named Nazareth. Verse 27, to a virgin betrothed. Their engagement in ancient Jewish culture was a betrothal. And a betrothal was as certain as marriage. In fact, if you wanted to break up your relationship during engagement, during betrothal, you had to get a divorce. Typically, betrothals were for a period of one year or less. But you were considered married, except that you didn't live together. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mary, we know, was a young peasant woman, probably quite young, probably in the range of age of 13 to 15 years of age. She would have been a woman of meager education because in those days, in most Jewish families, the boys went to school that was held at the synagogue, and they learned also the trade of their father, and the mother would teach the daughters the things that they needed to know. But although Mary had meager education, she had immense wisdom. Let's define some terms. How would you define knowledge? You might say knowledge is acquaintance with facts. So how would you define education? I know we've got educators in the room, so I've got to be careful, but I think education, everybody would agree, is the process of learning, right? Education is the acquisition of knowledge and skills and values and beliefs. So when we're putting our kids into a school, whether it's homeschooling or the public school or a private school, whatever, we want to put them in a school where they are going to learn knowledge where they are going to develop skills, but we've also got to be very protective of the values and beliefs that they acquire. Right? That's something that a parent has to think about. So if that's what knowledge is, and that's what education is, what then is wisdom? Wisdom is understanding truth. And the biblical concept of wisdom is having a proper, accurate, God-centered world view living in light of how his truth applies to our lives. So you might say that knowledge is an exercise of the brain and wisdom would be an activity of the heart. In the Bible, a commitment to wisdom is something that leads to life transformation. And if Christ doesn't return soon, I wonder if future generations will look back on us and say, this generation was the most educated, but also the most lacking in wisdom. Here's what Schaefer said. Schaefer said this decades ago. Quote, from the Christian viewpoint, no man has ever been so naive nor so ignorant of the universe as the 20th century man. If he were alive, what would Schaefer say about our day and age? Verse 28. And he, the angel, came to her, Mary, and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Fear, and if you read through the Christmas narrative in the Bible this season, you will notice that fear is a common theme in the biblical story. What is fear? How would you define it? Because fear is a, a strong, it's a, it's a negative emotion, and it's a reaction to a threat of or the presence of danger. Right? We all understand that. Have you ever looked at those uh, lists of, of the top things that people are afraid of? You know which one is usually close to number one? It's called glossophobia. I had to look it up. It means the fear of public speaking. <laughs> top three usually has necrophobia, the fear of death. Here's another one, arachnophobia, the fear of Spiders. Acluophobia, the fear of darkness. Acrophobia, the fear of heights. The readers for Time magazine are much more sophisticated. Time did a survey in 2015. 
and none of those things were in the top five. Time magazine readers had these as their top sources of fear. Number one, corruption of government officials. Almost 60% of people said that one. Number two, cyber terrorism, that somebody hacks into your computer and does damage. Number three, corporate tracking of personal information. Number four, terrorist attacks. Number five, government tracking of personal information. No matter what you're afraid of, it's clear in the Bible story of Christmas that fear pops up constantly. Think of the examples. Who is the father of John the Baptist? What was his name? This is the point where you jump in. Zechariah, thank you. Zechariah was a priest in the temple, and all of a sudden, without expecting it, he is confronted by a, a heavenly messenger, an angel. This supernatural heavenly being confronts him. There's all kinds of reason to be fearful. And the angel says to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. What about Joseph? He's betrothed to Mary. He has lots of reason to be, to be fearful. The girl he's engaged to is now pregnant, and he knows he's not the one. If not him, then whom? What about their future together? What's he going to tell his parents? What's he going to tell her parents? How are they going to explain to their family and friends what's going on? How would he ever defend her honor? No wonder his mind was in turmoil. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, Matthew 1 says, and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Notice that? Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. What about the classic example, the Jewish shepherds on the hillside outside of Jerusalem? Here's the one thing that they were not afraid of. Jewish shepherds in and around Jerusalem were never fearful of having adequate market to sell their sheep. Because Josephus tells us every year at Passover, they slaughtered 250,000 lambs in Jerusalem Passover weekend. So they're never going to have a problem with a market. Their problem was not a fear of the market. Their problem was a fear that occurred one night in the Judean darkness when it was shattered by an angelic messenger and a heavenly choir. You know the story. The scene was awash with the overpowering blaze of the glory of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, Luke says, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid, the King James Version says. Many of the modern versions say they were terrified. And then finally, think of those Gentile magi, the wise men, coming from the east, procession into Jerusalem. They were important enough that they were able to have an audience with King Herod. And as they're before Herod, in the final months of his life, and just as an aside, to make it more interesting, Herod is becoming more arbitrary, more paranoid, more unpredictable, and more violent with every passing day. And these Magi show up and they ask a pretty obvious question. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Matthew says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Or your Bible may say disturbed. And that's sort of a weak translation because we don't really have a great word for that. Maybe it would be better to say, Herod was apoplectic and all Jerusalem with him. The Greek word terasso that gets translated as troubled or disturbed might be best pictured by your kitchen blender, especially if you've got one of those really powerful, noisy ones like we do. When you turn it on, you can just hear, the whole, hear it through the whole house. That's how Herod felt when he heard the news of this king of the Jews. Fearful. Fear is all over the Christmas story. And Mary was deeply troubled by the appearance of the archangel. She was afraid. Verse 31. And then the angel goes on to tell the story. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
and of his kingdom there will be no end. The angel was telling the what in what child is this? And his message was really a five-part message, right? The child that would be born would be a male child, a son. They were to give him the name Jesus. He would be great. Now, chapter 1 told us that John the Baptist would also be great. That was the prediction of the angel. But the Lord Jesus was going to be greater because, number three, in addition to being this male son named Jesus and being great, number three, he would be called Son of the Most High. The Old Testament prophets, I am convinced, had very little concept of who the Messiah would be. They knew he would be great. They knew he would be a king. They, would knew, he, they knew he would be a prophet. They knew he would be the finest Hebrew that ever lived. But I don't think they ever conceived that the Messiah would be God. And I'm not sure Mary understood that. That he would be the son of the Most High, meaning that he is God. Number four, he would be given the throne of David, both Joseph and Mary, although peasants, were descendants of David. And the angel said, number five, that this one who would be born of Mary would reign over Israel forever in a never-ending kingdom. And she asked the obvious question in verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? So the angel had told her the what. She's now asking the how. It's easy for us to think, well, these people in Bible times, they were simply superstitious folks. They were easily deceived. The angel comes along and tells her she's going to have a baby, and she gave it not another thought. No, that's not true. These people were just like us. When things happen, they deferred to what is natural, the laws of nature. But when the natural supplied an insufficient explanatory scope, then they started, like us, to think about Maybe this is beyond natural. Maybe this is beyond nature. Maybe this is supernatural. I think we do the same today. We're much more incredulous or dubious or skeptical. But I think of the irony of some of my friends who are well-educated, sophisticated people, and when they can't explain something, what do they say? That's fate. Or... That's just chance. Or that's the categorical imperative. Or that's the universal spirit. As if those abstract concepts are somehow entities in themselves. Which, of course, they're not. Why do they do that? Why do people say, I only believe what can be proven by science, except when I go through really difficult times, except when I suffer tragedy? Then they're reaching for what I call borrowed capital. They're thinking of a supernatural worldview that they have always rejected, but they know that that's the only reason or the only way of explaining it. Why do they do that? 3,000 years ago, Solomon said that God has placed eternity in our hearts. Verse 35. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The God who created the universe and who created life by the power of his spoken word is going to have no trouble causing a virgin birth. And then the angel gave this confirming sign. Verse 36. Behold, your, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age. She has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Given Elizabeth's age, this was miraculous. A sure sign of confirmation that what Mary was experiencing was not a bad dream, it was not a hallucination, this was a message from God. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Two takeaways. Two application points and we're done. Number one. This is a diagnostic question for you and for me to think about as we consider this story. What 
is the purpose? What is the single purpose, the overriding, overarching purpose of your life? What's the objective? What's the intention? What, what's the desired result? When you get to the end of your life, if you're able to look back on your life and determine whether your life was a win or a loss, whether it was a success or a failure, by what criteria will you determine that? Will it be financial goals or vocational goals, things that you've achieved? Will it be that I've, we've raised our kids and our kids have gone on to be successful? Will it be that we had grandchildren? That was our goal in life, to live long enough and to have our kids have grandchildren and then we'll have been successful. Or fill in this blank. More than anything else, what I want in my life is to be... What would that be for you? Some people would say, more than anything else, what I want is to be retired. Or more than anything else, what I want in my life is to golf four days a, day, a week. Or more than anything else, what I want in my life is to travel. That starts to give you an idea of what your personal objective or purpose is. Mary, I am the servant of the Lord, she said, in verse 38. Let it be to me according to your word. So if you're a follower of Christ, and I know not everybody here this morning is, but if you're a follower of Christ, let me put this question to you. When you stand before the Lord someday, at the judgment seat of Christ, what will be most important in terms of what you have achieved, what you have accomplished, in terms of your purpose or your personal objective. I wonder how many of us will stand before the Lord with deep regret as we look back on our lives because we have not fulfilled in our lives the objectives that he has set. What objective has he set? Well, we are called as followers of Christ to reflect the glory of Christ in our lives every day in this dark world. And if you're a Christian, your marriage should reflect that. If you're a Christian, how you handle your resources should reflect that. If you're a follower of Christ, your reputation and character in the workplace should reflect that. Your choices for entertainment should reflect that. How you serve the Lord should reflect that. I often say there's two indications. If you want to know what's important to somebody... Check how they spend their money, check how they spend their time. That's obvious, right? If you get a hold of my credit card statement, you'll tell pretty quickly what's important to me. If I look at your calendar and everything's in there, I can tell pretty quickly what's important to you. Right? There's no fooling. That's just the, the data by which the decision is driven. Some of us need to think long and hard about how we spend our money and how we spend our time. What is my life's purpose? What is my life's overall overarching objective? For those who are serious in their relationship with Christ, one day they want to stand before him and hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Number two. Christmas is evidence of the truth of the gospel. Gabriel's prediction to Mary was 40 weeks before Bethlehem and 30 years before Calvary. This improbable young woman, this teenager, who's about to have a baby in nine months' time, that event, that very isolated birth is a reminder that although he had millions of reasons to do so, God refused and still refuses to quarantine himself. Right? He could have stayed up there. And yet God became man. 
The incarnation, the Christmas story, is about the enfleshment of God. God taking the initiative to bring rebellious, sinful, disappointing people back into relationship with himself. That's the gospel. This wonderful, holy, merciful, generous, loving, forgiving God, that character of God that's evident throughout the entire Old Testament, climaxes at the point of the Christmas story, climaxes at the point of the birth of Christ. And the story focuses on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who left the glory of heaven and took on humanity for the purpose of going to the cross. And that's why at Bethel we often say the gospel is, the gospel has always been about the person of Christ and the work of Christ. Not just Christ as the baby of Christmas, but the entire life of Christ leading up to and culminating in his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and his ultimate glorification. The gospel is the proclamation of good news of the person and work of Christ and the eternal benefit, the forever benefit to any person who responds in repentance and faith. That's the story of Christmas. That's the answer to the question, what child is this? Let's pray. Father, as we consider these things, we pray that you would continue by your Spirit to confront us. For those of us who are believers, Lord, we need to continue to be confronted by your Spirit and by your Word, challenging us in how we live our lives, what our purpose and objective is. And for those, Lord, who are not yet followers of Christ in this audience, may your spirit continue through this day and through this Christmas season to bring before them the truth of this one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This morning we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming to Bethel this morning.